So good afternoon, everyone. Um, this this workshop uh, will be pretty much on how to include the personal income distribution, and I'll talk about what I mean by that um, right after this uh, initial this introduction uh, into Neokalatskian uh, growth models. I'm not sure how many of you are. Uh, familiar or entirely familiar with neo and growth models. I imagine most of you since this conference, I guess most of the panels here are on this, but still I'm sure it's not the case for everyone, which means I'll start by, uh, I'll start with a little bit of a reminder on how these models are built and what are the basic assumptions and how we get to the idea of demand regimes, namely wage-led versus profit-led demand regimes. I'll talk a little bit, very quickly and briefly, on the empirical literature on these demand regimes or on, on finding uh, whether countries are wage-led or profit-led, which I guess many of you are working on since most of the people who work on these, uh, uh, on this type of research are associated with uh, professors who are uh, organizing this conference, uh, and then uh, I will get into two particular ideas and, and ways uh, that uh, the personal income distribution rather than the functional income distribution uh, can be uh, important for this type of analysis, both theoretical and empirical analysis. Basically, uh, the idea, well, the relationship between the functional distribution of income, meaning the wage share and the profit share, uh, and aggregate demand, um, goes back to, I guess, even classical political economists. Uh, but uh, the way it was introduced into the Kalatskian growth models or neo kalatskian growth models uh, has to do with, on the one hand, uh, the idea that uh, classes or different classes have different propensities to consume, meaning capitalists um, tend to consume less than workers. I guess the, the most common assumption there is that workers don't save at all in most of these models, but some models have been done with workers saving a little bit, but at least uh, less than, than capitalists. Um, and that means that consumption is sensitive to a redistribution from wages towards profits, right? So consumption tends to go down whenever you redistribute income um, from labor to profits. Uh, so that's the basic idea uh, in these models. And then in the, in the neo kalatskian models, you combine that with uh, an independent investment function, and that independent investment function assumes or takes different forms, depending on the model we're talking about. Uh, but in many of them, and especially in the Mar Margling-Baduri or Baduri-Margling specification, uh, investment is also sensitive to income distribution and the functional income distribution, meaning that it responds positively to the profit share. And not only, I, and then, well, you have, as I said, different functional forms and different specifications for the investment functions. Sometimes it depends directly on the profit share. Some, that's the case in Baduri Marglin. Uh, but sometimes it also depends on, it depends uh, on the profit share through the profit rate or the rate of profit, which is, of course, the profit share uh, plus uh, times a component that depends on aggregate demand itself. So when you combine these two things, meaning uh, differential savings and an investment function that depends on the profit rate or the profit share, you get to the possibility um, of different demand regimes in the economy, uh, meaning that whenever you redistribute income towards labor or wages, you tend to boost consumption on the one hand and to um, slow down investment on the other hand. And the net effect of that will determine whether the economy is wage-led or profit-led when it comes to aggregate demand. So that's a big summary of 
what this, this whole idea is about. Uh, if we take one particular uh, model here, uh, um, assuming that U is the rate of capacity utilization, and there in that particular case we're assuming that there is a, we're normalizing to one the relationship between the stock of capital and the potential output. So we're considering that capital productivity is not varying, is constant over time and is equal to one. Uh, then we can basically approximate uh, the degree of capacity utilization, which is defined as, uh, I'm not sure, people said I shouldn't go away from the microphone, but does it mean I cannot write in this thing? <laughs> So basically, the degree of capacity utilization here is defined as uh, GDP or income over potential GDP. But if we consider that there is a, a constant relationship between potential GDP and the capital stock, namely a constant capital productivity, uh, we can normalize it to one and, and use, as most of these models do, uh, uh, the, the output to capital ratio as a proxy uh, for the degree of capacity utilization. And that's our measure of demand. So that's how we measure the level of economic activity in the economy. The higher is U, the higher is uh, demand, aggregate demand, right? So then if uh, we take the wage share um, uh, as um, basically one minus the profit share and define it um, as the, the ratio between uh, the, uh, the wage bill, namely the product of the average wage and the amount of, uh, and the degree of uh, employment um, over GDP or nominal GDP uh, and the profit rate R as uh, the product of the profit share and U, the degree of capacity utilization, utilization. Uh, then we have our three main uh, variables in this model and we can solve it. Uh, the two functions there are the savings functions and the investment function. The investment function, GI, we're normalizing it to the capital stock. I'm not sure Maybe raise their hands whoever has seen a Kaletsky or no, neo Kaletskian models in their lives before. So I have an idea how much. Okay, so you haven't. So maybe I should slow down here. Should I? Yes, okay. Well, so let me, let me go back. So this model is, is, is basically solved with the adjusting variable being the level of aggregate demand. So in, it's a model, it's a demand-driven model. Aggregate demand is the one determining output, okay? So it's a Keynesian or, uh, uh, it's nothing too different from a Keynesian multiplier, simple Keynesian multiplier model. Uh, the difference here is that instead of having uh, a investment as autonomous, we have investment as depending on other things, including an induced component, as we'll see, it depends on aggregate demand itself. And instead of having a consumption function as just the function of a propensity to consume over total income, we'll have a consumption function that depends on income distribution. It depends on, on how uh, income is distributed between wages and profits. So think of a Keynesian simple multiplier model for those who have never seen this type of model, and we're just adding a little bit of a complication in the consumption function and in the investment function, which becomes sensitive to income distribution, all right? Uh, so the way we're measuring uh, demand is instead of measuring it uh, in levels or in terms of output only, we're measuring in terms of the utilization of capital. So we're basically uh, in, every other f in every other variable, we're also doing the same. So we're solving the model for U, the degree of capacity utilization, instead of solving the model for the level of income. 
which is the case in simple Keynesian multiplier models. Uh, so there, the GI function is basically what we call in these models the investment function. We're doing, uh, we're saying that I over K, namely the investment over K, which is the growth rate of capital in the absence of depreciation of capital, right? Uh, the growth rate of capital is, we have a behavioral equation for it, uh, which we define in aggregate terms, and that behavioral equation says that investment will de depends on an autonomous component, G0, or gamma zero. Gamma zero there can be the optimism of the firms, animal spirits, um, expectations that come from other things, I mean, whatever you want. Anything that does not depend on distribution or demand is included in that term, including credit conditions, whatever you want. Uh, then you have another term uh, which makes investment depends on, depend on you, the degree of capacity utilization itself. And the idea there, that's a, what we call a Steindalian uh, specification of the investment function or a kalatsky steindl specification of the investment function. The idea there is that uh, firms, when they invest, they look at the, how they're using, how much they're using their capital and they decide to invest based on whether they expect higher demand in the future. If they're using 80 or 90% of the, their, their capital, let's say they say, well, I'm going to expand ca my capital stock so that I can, um, I can accommodate an increase in demand in the next period. So that's uh, the basic idea there. And then the third term is the profit rate. So the idea is that firms look at the return they have on investment as also something that motivates them to invest more, and meaning that all the parameters there are positive, right? So gamma u and gamma r are parameters which uh, we can estimate, and as we see the models, the, the empirical literature on that estimates, uh, that capture the sensitivity of investment to demand and to the profit rate, right? But the profit rate is defined as the mass of profits over capital. And as you saw in the definition, the third equation there, that means we can decompose the profit rate in two components itself, the profit share and the output to capital ratio, which we're calling U. Okay? Therefore, uh, that investment function can be rewritten and in a way where you have an autonomous component, gamma zero, and then everything else that is induced, namely induced by demand, in depending, that depends on capacity utilization. Okay? Then in the savings function, which is basically, we can, you can start by a consumption function or you can start by the savings function directly. Uh, there what you have is that uh, savings as a level, uh, which is Y minus C, total output minus consumption, so it's defined here as aggregate saving, uh, over K, and we're normalizing it to K as well, uh, depends on um, the distribution of income because the savings propensities over the profits as pi uh, is higher than the savings propensities on uh, savings propensity on wages as W. Okay, so what I'm writing there is the same as what I'll write here. I'll be quiet now because I have to write. One So if I had written um, a cons in, in the form of a consumption function, which depends on, it, there is a CW, a propensity to consume over wages, and there when I say uh, psi y, I'm saying the, wage, the entire wage bill, right? So everything that goes to wages in levels, plus a C pi, propensity to consume over profits times total profits, 
in the economy, then you have aggregate consumption, right? So that's exactly the same thing. If I divide this whole thing by k, and I call s s small s pi 1 minus c, then I get to this. That's exactly the same thing. Uh, the model is solved by equalizing these two things. It's a closed economy, no government in this version of the model. Namely, so, so we need to have uh, savings equal investment, and the way savings are equalizing are equal to investment is through the adjustment of u, the degree of capacity utilization. That's what I'm doing in the last slide of, of the model. Okay, so this is basically equalizing gi and gs, substituting by the investment function I, I just showed and uh, the savings function I just showed, and solving it for u, the degree of capacity utilization. So I'm, I'm equalizing these two things and solving for u, and, there, and then I get the degree of capacity utilization in the macroeconomic equilibrium of in the short run, right? It's a short run model. And the degree of capacity utilization will be has it looks a lot like uh, a, a Keynesian multiplier uh, model where you have the autonomous components of aggregate demand in the numerator and then you have a multiplier that is basically uh, determining what the total demand will be, right? It's exactly the same thing except that the multiplier here is one over this entire denominator there that depends on income distribution, on the functional income distribution. Um, what, what we can say, so this delta, one over delta is the multiplier in this model, right? That's something greater than one, as such as in the Keynesian multiplier model. Uh, but you see there that, um, for instance, the higher is the profit share, we can't really know. I mean, we can already see there. You can't really know what, if this will increase or decrease the multiplier and therefore the degree of utilization in the equilibrium because on the one hand, you have an effect that is negative on consumption and positive on investment. So how do we know and how do we get to the conditions for each case, namely the case where you distribute or you, you increase the profit share pi and that leads to an increase in the degree of utilization in the equilibrium versus the case where you increase the profit share pi and that leads to a decrease in the utilization rate in the equilibrium. You basically take the differentiate, uh, you take the partial derivative of u star relative to pi, the profit share, and you get to that term there, where delta square is definitely positive. So the sign of this derivative will depend on the numerator only. And the numerator is the difference between two things. Gamma r, well, gamma zero is also positive. That's the, the term, the autonomous investment, uh, the, the autonomous components in the investment function. So basically the, the derivative there will depend on the sign, on the difference between gamma r and s pi minus sw, right? The economy will be wage-led whenever this derivative is negative, so you increase the profit share, you reduce aggregate demand, and, and profit-led otherwise, and as you can see, the, the, the wage light case is the case uh, when uh, the sensitivity of investment to the profit rate is relatively low, of course, because in that case, investment isn't really uh, uh, slow, is, does not slow down when, uh, when you redistribute towards wages, right? Uh, and the difference in the savings propensities is relatively high, meaning that consumption will be boosted quite a lot when you redistribute towards wages, right? So the, the, the two cases are defined as, uh, uh, when it, uh, well, the two cases are defined from, are determined from um, the sensitivity of consumption and investment 
to income distribution. So whenever investment is very sensitive and consumption isn't very sensitive because the propensities to save are very similar between the two classes, you have a profit-led economy. Whenever you have investment not very sensitive to distribution but consumption between the two classes very, very different, then you have a wedge-led economy. So that's the basic or one basic way to explain it. This is not... I wouldn't say this is the most common um, neo kaletskian model because I guess the Baduri, Mar the Baduri and Margling model is the one that is most read uh, and it has a little, a few differences we can talk about in the questions if we have time. There, there are a few differences between the Margling Baduri model and this particular uh, version here, but this one is also used quite a lot. I mean, you have I don't know, it's used most, most often it's used by Robert Blacker, who's probably gonna be here, Lance Taylor, um, um, even Mark Lavoie, I think uses this version most of the time. And so that's one very general way to, to explain the demand regimes idea. Of course, if there's no difference, if workers don't save at all, what are, you, what are you gonna do in this model? So if you add the assumptions, if you, you have a more extreme case and workers don't save at all, well, the SW is going to zero, you're strengthening the case for a wage-led economy, right? So it's just a, a, a specific case of this model, which is more, a little bit more general. So that, that theoretical indetermination led to a, a, a large empirical literature that basically tries to estimate these things and find whether countries are wage-led or profit-led, whether the demand in these countries are wage-led profit or profit-led. You have different types of, different methodologies that are used for this type of estimations. So um, there are a lot of estimations done using VARs or VEX that basically just uh, a two-dimensional VAR using as endogenous variables uh, the degree of capacity utilization or some measure of aggregate demand and uh, some measure of the wage share or income distribution because of course there is an effect that is, uh, goes the other way around so even that is in more um, complete neo kaletskian models you will have the effect of demand on income distribution appearing as well, given that, for instance, when the wage share goes up, uh, or when, when aggregate demand, when you have a boom in the economy, you tend to have lower unemployment, and therefore the way workers have a stronger bargaining power, that tends to increase the wage share. So that's the other side of the causality channel, right? Which we have also a lot of theoretical models that include that other side. In empirical estimations, uh, that do the, the sort of the VAR or the VEC kind of estimation strategies using these two variables, these two endogenous variables, you tend to find in most of them uh, evidence of profit-led demand. Um, that, well, that's not the case for every estimation, but then you started having, um, then you started doing most of the people these days they do single equation estimations, which separate the consumption function, the investment function, and net exports. Because as we saw, this was a closed economy model, and people started to realize that one of the strongest effects of income distribution wasn't on consumption and investment, but it was actually on net exports, given that countries lose competitiveness whenever the wage share goes up. So then you started having all these estimations, single equation estimations, where you estimate the sensitivity of consumption to the wage share, the sensitivity of investment to the wage share, the sensitivity of net exports to the wage share, and then you basically apply, took these coefficients, plugged into a model like that one I just showed, but an open economy version of it, and uh, got to a conclusion, well, country X is wage-led during that time period, country Y is profit-led during that time period. You have lots of literature doing this type of studies. If you, 
If you're interested in that, look for uh, Stockhammer's uh, students' works. There are many of them. Oslan um, Onaran's um, uh, students and her work herself. Galani's, uh, well, um, Eckhart Hines' students. I mean, most of the people who will be here at the conference students are doing exactly this. Probably some of you, right? Um, then, so the, uh, the role of open economy effects is already consolidated, and it's clear how that changes the original results and how important it is to include open economy effects whenever you're estimating these things and when you're um, doing theory on these things, right, uh, or building models on these things. Uh, if you don't do it, you tend to show profit-led demand and, and then you think that maybe it's profit-led demand because investment is boosted uh, more than consumption when in fact the closed economy would be wage-led but then it's really the open economy effect that is turning the economy profit-led and it's important to know these things given that if every country in the world redistributes towards profits at the same time, for instance, then the open economy effect will not show and the whole, the whole entire world will tend to be wage-led, even if get due to the fallacy of composition of this, this idea, right? Uh, so, well, that's, that's already, I guess, a consensus, the importance of open economy effects, and that led to a lot of extensions of the model that in include open economies, uh, that include open economy effects. The most uh, well-known is the one by Robert Blecker, who was the first one to to introduce this in these models. That's fine, but there are other problems in these estimations. Problems in us of the same kind, meaning things that were, I mean, we're looking at these results and we're saying, well, country X is profit-led, country Y is wage-led, and then people are um, taking or drawing policy implications from this and saying, well, that means that if this country is profit-led, then it would benefit this economy to, uh, I don't know, um, f um, uh, suppress wages in, in different ways, uh, reduce the minimum wage, or uh, introduce labor, uh, more flexible labor regulations. And people are just basically doing these econometrics, applying these point estimates to these uh, uh, to this very basic model, and reaching pretty strong conclusions. I mean, I'm not saying everyone does that, um, but what I'm saying is that um, there are a lot of different issues uh, that we have to consider when we're trying to go from a very interesting and important empirical exercise into policy implications and conclusions. Uh, I'm, I'm just talking here about some of them uh, that are already addressed. I mean, some of these are addressed in one model or the other in theoretical models that incorporate these things, but still the empirical literature isn't uh, absorbing the advances of the theoretical literature. I would, I would say that, uh, that, is, is, that is still very clear. Of course, it takes a while. Uh, so for instance, one thing that the theoretical literature, and there are a lot of new papers, new papers, and there, there aren't even that new anymore, but after the 2008 crisis, there started to pop up papers in the New Kalatskan literatures that include household debt. Why so? Well, there seems to be a bit of a consensus that while uh, you had uh, a stagnation of wages in some developed economies, um, since the 80s and throughout the 90s, you also had a build-up in household debt, and in a way that allowed for a consumption, for a boom in consumption, uh, even if you were, you were redistributing towards profits, right? So if you don't take household debt into account and you estimate a model for an economy that is going through a process like this, what is the impression you're going to have? from your results. You're going to see that consumption isn't very sensitive to income redistribution because you'll see consumption booming while the wage share 
is stagnant or decreasing even in some economies. And you're going to reach the conclusion, well, then this economy may be profit-led. Uh, consumption isn't very sensitive. Investment seems to be a little bit more. And, or net exports seem to be a little bit more. And therefore, I'm in a profit-led economy. And so redistributing uh, against wages is a good thing. It's a great thing. Maybe that's not really the case. Maybe you're actually uh, you're, you're seeing the effect of household debt, which we all know what it can lead to, uh, and, and taking that as an evidence for uh, a low impact of redistribution on consumption. So that's one additional bias in the estimations that do not look at household debt. So one thing you can control for, or at least do some kind of treatment of when you're estimating these things, is definitely household debt. You have evidence on short-run and long-run effects of household debt on aggregate demand in a lot of theoretical models already by Amitava Dutt and by other people. Uh, financialization. So, for instance, the change in the behavior of firms who are less and less oriented by um, an interest in, in growing uh, or becoming larger and are more and more oriented by shareholder value orientation. This entire literature that you may be familiar with, uh, there's strong econometric evidence on a change in investment behavior by firms. Uh, that's just one thing. Uh, financialization is a very broad term that, as you know, includes many other aspects. But in any case, that's one other thing that may be changing uh, econometric results and that should be incorporated. Uh, one other uh, aspect uh, that has been developed in some econometric studies and seems to, uh, seems to, to be important in these estimations is the presence of nonlinearities. So there's a paper by uh, Mihalis Nikiforos and, and Duncan Foley that try to, to, to do uh, nonlinear econometrics on that. There are other papers doing the same or similar things. Um, because if you think about it, uh, if there are no nonlinearities in the relationship between demand and distribution, that would basically mean that, uh, say, you're in a wage led economy, um, then Increasing the weight share to one maximizes aggregate demand and, in some of these models, economic growth, right? Which, I mean, maybe, um, uh, never say never, but it does seem a little bit strange. Even, I mean, in either case, right? So if you redistribute the entire inc national income towards profits in a profit-led economy, that would also maximize aggregate demand. So that seems a little bit strange, uh, which um, led to a few models that try to, to introduce the idea that maybe there are nonlinearities in this. Maybe when you have a very high wage share and increase it a little bit more, then uh, you switch the demand regime uh, uh, and you, that, that, that doesn't lead to the type of stimulus that it leads when you have a very low wage share. So you have estimations that, that try to introduce nonlinearities. That's a bit more difficult for, for countries that don't, don't have a lot of data available because uh, the techniques that allow you to introduce nonlinearities require very large uh, time series, especially if you're doing time series econometrics. You, you need a very large time series to, to, to use, say, threshold VARs or, or things like that to, to do this thing, or even structural breaks. You need a larger series. So for the US, that's fine. For countries like Brazil, um, it's a bit more difficult to address. Then you have another issue which, and, and these I'm saying here, it's not the particular uh, topic I'm developing which will be on the last one, on precisely the role of the personal income distribution. Uh, but I'm saying these things because I guess many of you are working on this or will be working on this and, and will develop research on these ideas and I guess these are things that are sort of out there and have been 
uh, started started to be addressed by different people and can lead to very interesting research projects. Um, given that, I mean, the most of the literature does not take these things into account. The role of specific policies. So uh, Robert Blacker himself and also Tom, pa Tom Paley in, in other papers talk about this a lot. So if you think about the policy implications, even if you are convinced that a country is wage-led, meaning that increasing the wage share will boost aggregate demand, even if you're convinced of that, uh, does it mean that, I mean, the wage share itself is not a policy variable, right? I mean, in order to affect the wage share, you have very different ways to do it. So you can do it by increasing the minimum wage, or you can do it by changing labor regulations, or you can do it, I mean, by changing the exchange rate, right? So is the type of policy that is used to redistribute uh, income towards wages or against wages, uh, is it irrelevant for the actual result on aggregate demand? So that's another important very important question, and, and if you think about models that actually um, are complete models and, and go up to the point of having these variables in the model, uh, you will see that it doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, if when you increase the minimum wage, you have an effect that is different than when you devalue the exchange rate, uh, because, well, the effect on, on certain components of aggregate demand is different. Right? So, of course, the models are very useful for um, theoretical purposes and to, to basically introduce these ideas and, and, and have those channels in mind, but they don't uh, serve the purpose well of just come going from that model, that version of the model, to policy implications. seems to be a little bit more complicated given, unless you you have very complete models where the policy variables are present and the wage share is not a policy variable, right? As we saw, it's even an endogenous variable. Okay, so the, the second to last point, um, Tom Pally has a paper on this, the idea that the demand regimes are endogenous, meaning that whether the economy was wage-led or the economy is profit-led, um, may depend on the institutions of the, the economy and, and may depend on how, what, the policies are, what the policies have been in practice. So it doesn't mean that these things are not necessarily stable and neutral to other, other things, right? So that's one criticism that is even, I would say, deeper than the other ones because they're, it's more difficult to address econometrically. Uh, the fact that if you don't think that that derivative, the, the, the effect of redistribution on demand is something that can be estimated, then you should probably do something else, right? But it's important to think about this as well. And finally, I get to my focus here after this very long introduction. Um, which is the personal distribution of income. So if you think about um, the evidence that, say, Piketty and Saez, um, um, then you had Piketty's bestseller, uh, but all this data uh, that you have using tax data that told us so much about um, the income distribution, uh, and the personal income distribution, as I would say, how income is dis distributed in quintiles, how wealth is distributed in quintiles, uh, this, the top 1%, these kind of things. Uh, what it shows for some countries is that inequality has increased due to uh, higher concentration in wealth, but some o for some other countries, and especially the U.S., um, it's, there seems to be an evidence of actually an increase in wages at the top as one of the explanations for higher inequality. And then I had this idea even that the working rich have replaced the rentiers in the top 
um, at the top of the income distribution in the U.S. I have a lot of work given by Marxist economies, such as Simon Mohun uh, does this, but there are others who talk about uh, why this is the case, especially uh, the role of managers or supervisory workers and executives, basically. Uh, those salaries uh, that, are, that increase quite a lot um, um, have um, an impact on inequality or are one of the causes for higher inequality, right? So the question here is, well, isn't this type of redistribution Namely, the fact that wages aren't distributed equally, aren't distributed equally across workers, that there is actually an inequality even among wage earners, and it's a pretty big one. And even in, I mean, the fact that you also have profit income going to some of these executives, and, and I mean, this income isn't really the classes in terms of capitalists and workers, aren't maybe the best way to, de to define or to think of income distribution in that case. And well, we have this entire literature, this Neokalatskan literature, which is very good and I would say is much better than, say, Piketty's work, Piketty's theoretical work, in terms of relating economic growth and income distribution. But at the same time, this literature does not address many of the problems that Piketty's data and all the other people working on this data uh, show. And then you have this sort of this disconnect. When, when these things started popping up, you had uh, in our community of Neokalatskians and people who work on this, I mean, everyone read the book and said, well, Fine, I mean, this data is very interesting, but you know, this explanation isn't that interesting. This explanation here is lacking something. Aggregate demand is totally absent from this analysis. Um, and we, we have all these models here that already talked about this. And you know, the, these people are saying that macroeconomists don't talk about income distribution when you have a whole field developed around economic growth and this income distribution. Except that, well, but, there is a but, this literature talks about the functional income distribution. It did not talk about the personal income distribution, meaning how national income is distributed among, well, the poor and the rich. There's no poor and rich. There's capitalists and workers, right? So one question is, uh, what is the effect of rising income inequality among wage earners, that's one particular question. There are many others that have been developed by different, different people already. But one question is, what, do you, what is the effect of rising income inequality among wage earners in that framework? Um, is that affecting those empirical results as well? Isn't that another factor uh, biasing that creates a bias in the estimations? on wage-led versus profit-led demand regimes. Why would that be, right? So if you look at the US savings rates, and this is uh, taken from the Consumer Expenditure Survey, but there, there are issues with that survey. I mean, the, the data isn't very reliable, especially when you try to compare it with the national accounts data. But it still shows a little bit of uh, what, I, what I'm talking about. So I'll use that for now. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, if you divide consumption, well, savings, uh, for different uh, quantiles of the distribution, of income distribution, uh, by their income, which is really an average uh, savings measure, it's not a, a, a marginal propensity. You can, I'm not measuring that. I'm just taking total savings for that particular class divided by their income, you see that, well, there seems to be a very clear positive relationship. The more you move to the top of the income distribution, the higher is the savings rate. Of course, I mean, that seems quite intuitive. But the fact is that the Kaletskian models that do not um, uh, make that distinction, meaning that when you have the model we just saw, has SW or CW, right? One propensity to consume on, on 
on wage income, and that does not depend on whether you're in the top or in the bottom of the income distribution. It's pretty much you're assuming it's the same for everyone. If you think about the evidence, so if you estimate, you take the US, and you estimate a demand regime, and you, and you see that consumption isn't, um, consumption isn't uh, increasing much when you are redistributing towards wages. And you reach the conclusion that, well, that economy is profit-led. If you, if you think about it uh, a little bit more and you know the evidence that, well, while the wages were stagnant or wages were falling in the US, you had a big increase. Some, some workers were gaining quite a lot, those at the top, right? Uh, so then, well, that seems to be uh, a problem for these estimations. If you consider, if you think that, well, maybe then each sort of each increase or each small increase in the wage share that, or in wages that you saw happening did not lead to much consumption, not increase consumption quite a lot, but maybe that's because that increase in wages that you saw happening went to the people who don't consume instead of going to the people that would have a propensity to, to consume very close to one, those at the bottom, right? So it's not neutral. The way if you take the aggregate wage share and you measure its effect on growth, it's going to depend on whether it's going to the top wage earners or to the bottom wage earners, the, f the effect on consumption, right? So well, that's a problem everyone started to realize. I mean, Tom, Tom Paley, I, I have these, these examples here, but Tom Paley has a paper that is more recent that uh, tries to, to introduce even the possibility, he has a three-class model, where basically the way he addresses it is that you, ha you had another class introduced in the model that has hybrid income, some kind of managerial class that has income from wages and from profits. And he does a uh, Kaletskan model on that. Uh, but before that, you had uh, a paper by Daniele Tavanian and Rama Vazudevan from 2012, which basically added an unproductive managerial class to the basic new Kaletskan framework to address this issue. So he had um, also a three-class model where he had workers, capitalists, and a managerial investment class, and he analyzed the dynamics of the wage inequality or the difference between wages in those two classes or income in these two class, these three classes, and how it evolved and how it affected demand and so on. So that was a, a first attempt to, to do that. Uh, then uh, I wrote a paper with Armand uh, Rezai, uh, which uh, is in the Cambridge Journal of Economics, which does something a little bit simpler than that but we also did some estimations, which I will show uh, now. Um, uh, basically, by considering that the savings rate or the aggregate savings rate is an increasing function of wage inequality in the economy. The, um, the more unequal wages are distributed, the higher is the savings rate. And I'll, I'll now present this. Um, in the time that I have left, very quickly, because I want time for questions. Um, so basically, the idea is the following. Don't get too scared. If you, if you don't want to look at that integral, just listen to me, because it will make sense in any case. Um, I know it's after lunch, and maybe that's, that's too much. So the, the idea is the following. Um, why are savings rates different if one, someone is richer and, and or, or poorer, right? So that's, that's the question. I mean, we observe that in the data. Seems very intuitive. There are different reasons for it. Of course, you have a subsistence level uh, of consumption that needs to be attained. And then when you go further, uh, you start having less needs. That's one explanation. But that doesn't explain the fact that whenever you, s you keep moving, towards the top of the income distribution, and you keep increasing the savings rate. In order to, to explain that, you, I mean, it's, it seems to be the case that, well, that basic basket of consumption, 
that you're thinking of is not really subsistence, meaning that it's constant and stable and it's just there and whenever you're consuming, you're earning more than that, then you're not consuming anything anymore. It seems to have, this seems to be a bundle or a basket of consumption that sort of evolves over time and that is also uh, taken as a, as a standard by the different um, income earners in different classes, right? And that standard depends on the income at the top itself. It depends on consumption at the top itself. So I'm, I'm not sure you, I mean, there are several Neoclassical models even and other models that talk about emulation in consumption, right? The fact that maybe whenever the rich get richer, they consume more, that tends to um, increase consumption at the bottom of the distribution as well because people are trying to reach the consumption standard of those at the top. Which does not mean that people are trying to buy uh, Ferraris, right? It's, it, it may mean, for instance, uh, that people are, um, I, I don't know, there are things such as health insurance, there are other things that are external to that that start becoming a basic need in some countries or in others um, and leads to that consumption pattern, uh, that, that increase in consumption. Anyway, uh, if you think about that and the way to formalize it, uh, that is very simple, uh, is basically to say that savings by each individual d does not depend on only on its own income, but also on some measure of the aggregate. In, in our case, we take the median income of the economy, meaning that the higher is the income of that person relative to the median income, the more you will tend to consume uh, no, the less it will tend to consume relative to its income. So basically you're saying if you are below the median income, you're going to consume relatively more because you're trying to reach the consumption basket that is represented by that median income. If you're uh, above that median income, we will tend to consume relatively less of your income because you're already fulfilling the needs of that median income, which is here a representation of the basket, uh, the, some sort of standard, okay? If you do that, very simply, it's a way to put it, then you aggregate uh, your saving function. Um, and, I mean, we do it with a Pareto distribution, but you can do it with very different ones. The idea, and if you're interested in that, you'll read the paper, but the whole point is that when you do this kind of consumption function, you get to a relationship that is negative between inequality, positive between inequality and the propensity to consume, the average propensity to consume in the economy. So the higher is inequality, the higher is SW, our SW, that we were considering that. Um, in our particular model, we show that the Neocolatskan case that I just uh, uh, show to you is a particular case in the model. It's a case when you have a parameter of the Pareto that leads to totally equal distribution. Go, if you tend to equalize, if you equalize distribution among everyone, everyone gets the same wage, pretty much. Then you get to, uh, in this model, you get to a model where uh, SW is a constant. Whenever you have a different in type of distribution, then the constant, well, the SW will depend uh, positively on inequality. So that's pretty much what we do. We end up with a, uh, we end up with a, a, s a propensity to save that depends on that parameter sigma, and that's the only difference between this model and the Neokolaskan model, and that sigma is a measure of inequality among wage earners, okay? We reach, we reach the equilibrium, and we show how in that, case, reducing inequality among wage earners will always stimulate aggregate demand, of course, because you have a savings rate that is uh, reduced whenever you reduce inequality, and that boosts consumption in an aggregate demand-driven model. That's a positive thing. But the impact on the demand regime is ambiguous, namely, you can have an economy going, moving towards a more profit-ladness or less profit-ladness when inequality goes up. 
I, I won't have time to, to go why, on why it's so, but basically what it means is that when you reduce wage inequality and you are in a wage-led or weekly profit-led economy, and weekly it's defined by some of the parameters there, um, when you're in these economies, which are most economies, um, let's say, then when you reduce wage inequality, you push aggregate demand um, uh, to the right, but you also change the slope of that curve, namely that you, you're going to have um, more a more wage-led economy, or the economy turns more wage-led when you reduce wage inequality than it was before in those cases, which in the estimations mean that you may be having a bias in in the coefficients you're estimating, right? Because you're, you're, you're abstracting completely from wage inequality and you're taking a time series and trying to find uh, whether the economy is wage-led or not. And well, there seems to be at least the theoretical possibility that uh, the degree of inequality actually affects that slope that you're estimating, the exact slope that you're trying to estimate, right? Uh, we took the data for the US, we re-estimated, we basically, re-estimated uh, an empirical study uh, that already existed that showed that the U.S. was a profit-led economy. It's the study by uh, Barbosa Filho and, and Taylor. Um, and we show, and we basically apply a method that allows us to see whether uh, inequality or the increase in inequality has uh, made the U.S. move or the coefficient has substantially, substantially changed in that relationship, in that VAR, um, after inequality started increasing. Um, and that's the main uh, result there. Um, that basically, if you look at the profit-led effect, meaning how negative is the effect of increasing the labor share on the utilization rate that is measured in that VAR, I'm not taking any of the other problems with those estimations here. This is only the role of wage inequality in these results, then you see that, well, the high inequality period, which is found endogenously there, because it's a threshold var that looks at uh, the Gini index as one of the threshold variables, the high inequality period has a more profit-led response of utilization to the wage share than the low inequality period. Um, the High inequality there is about the threshold, which the model found is 1981. It coincides pretty much with uh, what the literature sees as the period of increasing inequality in the US. Okay, so well, there seems to be um, uh, an evidence that the results that we're doing is, at least in the case of the US. Uh, the results that we're finding uh, of a profit-led economy, maybe it's not really a profit-led economy, it's the fact that income has been distributed unequally, um, even among wage earners. Uh, and that is to, that is to basically um, show that that's one of the points, that the size or the personal distribution of income emerges as another important um, bias in the traditional Neokaletskian uh, estimations, um, such as the other ones that I said, so I'm not saying this is the most important one, but it is, it seems to be quite important that we, at least when we're trying to uh, draw policy implications that we think about this. Uh, when it comes to policy implications itself, well, that means that maybe things that do not even change the functional distribution of income such as taxes and transfer schemes or other things that actually change uh, or the minimum wage uh, policy, things that change the, the disparity among wage earners or income earners in general, uh, can prove effective to boost aggregate demand. And, and we, as people who deal with uh, the relationship between income distribution and demand, may be focusing too much on uh, the weight share and the profit la uh, share and too little on other measures of income distribution among wage earners. Uh, so that's, that, that's pretty much it. I even had a few more slides in case we, we had time which would talk particularly about the Brazilian experience because we also have 
some work talking about how important it was the, the, the reduction in wage inequality in the 2000s in the Brazilian process of growth. But I, I prefer to, to leave your time for questions and, and debates and criticisms and anything you like. Thank you very much.